Welcome to module number 46. We're going to be covering sparse recovery. So recall that we started compressensing. The big idea here is that when signals are sparse with respect to some uh, representation, uh, it could be a basis or a, a frame, uh, and sparsity would mean that we expect that for most signals in the class of signals of interest, uh, the large majority of the coefficients will be near zero, just a few will be large. When that happens, when the signals are expected to be sparse, uh, number one, we can acquire them uh, using random projections. And number two, uh, we can recover the original signal quite well. Uh, we've discussed some, some ways how we can perform uh, in hardware, how to uh, acquire these random projections. And today we're gonna to start talking, or in this module, we're gonna start talking about uh, sparse recovery. So before compressed sensing, in a different era, you know, in the 13th century, when people uh, uh, had weird haircuts and all of that stuff, there was L2. So the goal was given the measurements Y, we wanna find a signal X. So similar before X is a vector, the blue boxes are a small number of large coefficients and most of the boxes are white, small coefficients. We multiply x by a matrix phi, resulting in measurements y. Now, maybe they're noisy and they're not on this slide and we can cover that later, but for now, y equals phi x. And overall, there are fewer rows and columns in the measurement matrix phi. And because of that, this is an ill-posed problem. There are infinitely many x hats such that y is equal to phi times x hat. However, many of those x hats are not sparse. And we know that x happens to be sparse. And that's the, the that will turn out to be the key to the solution, utilizing the sparsity information in the reconstruction procedure. But for now, you know, out of all of these infinitely many solutions, uh, there's an entire subspace of solutions, x hats, uh, such that y is equal to phi times x hat. The classical approach is to choose the least squares one. So x hat, the specific solution chosen, is going to be the argument among all the x's that satisfy y equals phi x, an argument over the L2 norm of x. And recall that the L2 norm of x is a summation over the elements in x. Let's say the indices can be denoted by, by i, summation over the squared magnitude of xi. And we also need to take the square root of that. Now, in contrast, an L1 norm, recall, is equal to a summation. Again, a summation is over i, i are the indices of the absolute value of xi. All right, so what we're, what we're looking for is the x that satisfies the measurements with smallest L2 norm. That's called least squares. And it so happens, as we've discussed earlier in the course, that there's a closed form solution. X hat is equal to the pseudo inverse matrix. So let's just call this pseudo of phi multiplied by y. Oftentimes it's denoted by uh, phi plus, uh, the, soup, the, the, mm, the, the, the plus uh, will be denoting uh, the pseudo inverse. And this pseudo inverse matrix is, is actually a matrix, okay? So X hat is a matrix multiplied by Y, or in other words, X hat is linear in Y. And as we've just discussed before in the course, uh, a linear solution may, may, may not actually be best, but I'm just saying this was the classical solution. So let's let's move on. So sure, L2 is fine, and people use it for hundreds of years. But the problem is that a small L2 norm doesn't necessarily imply sparsity. So here's an example where x is sparse, and x hat would be uh, dense, dense meaning the opposite of sparse, a lot of small coefficients. Now, now why, why is that? The, the intuition could be as follows. Um, if you think about it, I, I said earlier, that there's a subspace of solutions to the data. So imagine that this would be x along dimension number one and x along dimension number two, x along dimension number three. And there's a subspace 
of x of x's or x hats that explain y. So imagine, let's do this in a different color. Imagine that this is that subspace. Now, parts of the subspace might actually be sparse. So let me, in dashed red lines, maybe this part is sparse and there's an intersection here. And this part, and this part, and the dashed lines are too sparse. There are two non-zero elements, and these three points are one sparse. So in this contrived, very small example, three dimensions, you know, it would make sense that one of the three points is a reasonable point. We would want a sparsity one solution. That that might be the case for such a small problem. And if X maybe in this illustration has maybe uh, 300 elements, just you know, choosing a number, maybe we're looking for solutions that are up to 10 sparse, okay? And X hat is not sparse at all, and we're not utilizing the sparsity. So we have a small L2, but we're not utilizing the sparsity. Now, what does it mean, small L2? So in blue, in my three-dimensional example, I had a plane, which is the subspace of solutions to y equals phi x. But now let's have another, uh, another illustration of what a small L2 means. So around the origin, we're starting to blow up a balloon, a sphere. And at some point, the sphere touches the, the plane at this point. And that point is the solution. So we, we took this sphere, we took the balloon, which we're blowing up around the origin. We're making it larger and larger and larger radius. We're blowing air into it until for the first time, it touches the plane. That's the solution on the plane with smallest energy. And why would it be sparse? There's no reason to believe that it's sparse because, because let's recall that the plane is going to be tangent to the sphere. That's the first time it has the property. The first time that we're that we touch, uh, uh, th that we touch the plane, it'll have the property that we're going to be tangent to the plane. And why would that, by chance, uh, be a sparse solution? Why would it fit on these axes? There's no reason for that. So this the so L two, the classical solution, has its limitations. All right, so. On one extreme, we have the classical approach. So what would the ideal compressed sensing solution be? L0. So an L0 norm, it's not really a norm. Formally, uh, formally it counts the number of non-zero entries in X. And it's not formally a norm, but you know we, people call it an L0 norm. And the ideal solution is to exploit the sparsity of X by seeking the sparsest solution among solutions in that subspace. So again, I had this three-dimensional thing and earlier my axes were red and now my axes will be blue and earlier my hyperplane was blue and now my hyperplane will be red. And similar before, we're illustrating where uh, the locations where the hyperplane is sparse, the dashed lines are too sparse. So I'm writing two. And these three intersection points are one sparse. So out of the infinitely many solutions in this two-dimensional plane, we seek the sparsest one, meaning one of these three points with that are one sparse. So x hat will be among the explanations to y equals phi x, the one that minimizes the L0 norm. So this is this is good. Utilizes sparsity. However, well, it so happens. Imagine that you have k, the number of blue boxes, the degree of sparsity. So I'll just call it the number of blue, and I probably should have written this in, uh, or, or uh, annotated this in, in blue, and I did it in red by mistake, but whatever. If the number of measurements m is less than or equal to k, then with high probability, uh, this can't be done, meaning that there's not going to be a, a sparse solution. 
On the other hand, as you increase the number of measurements, once the number of measurements exceeds k, with high probability, perfect reconstruction is indeed feasible. Now, I just want to highlight, this is kind of a, a toy problem, what I'm describing. We're ignoring measurement noise, and the procedure that performs this perfect reconstruction has combinatorial complexity. Because I'm ignoring measurement noise, this is not robust. And measurement noise doesn't necessarily need to come from uh, plus z. Measurement noise could also be that we've miscalibrated the phi matrix, and the true phi matrix is a bit different than what we imagine it is. So there are different types of noise that could appear in the problem, and we've ignored them. But at least in theory, if you're willing to accept a combinatorial complexity, L0 is a good approach. So L2 doesn't has its weaknesses, L0 has its weaknesses, and the revelation that led to compressed sensing was, was L1. Among the infinitely many solutions to y equals phi x, and that's the subject to, x hat will be the one that minimizes the L1 norm of x. Again, the L1 norm is a sum over the magnitude of the x size. So we began with the L2 norm, we, we said that we were blowing up this balloon and it was tangent to the plane. Not good, not necessarily sparse. So we, we were, that approach ignored information about the sparsity of solution. And then the other extreme of we totally want to focus on sparsity is not robust and, uh, and also computationally prohibitive, but L1 is actually reasonable. So L1 is, well, by chance, one is between zero and two. And this is reasonable. So first of all, if the number of measurements is some multiple of k, uh, typically three to five k is reasonable, then perfect reconstruction is possible with high probability, as shown by Candice et al., Donahoe, and other authors also. And moreover, more interestingly, uh, a linear programming implementation offers a poly polynomial time solution. And it's robust, so later you can add a bit of noise or perturbation. So the L1 solution bridges between the disadvantages of the L0 and the L1. So another aspect that I'd like to, to point out is the issue of recall that I said that we're going to be sparse relative to some basis or frame. But how do we do that? That's a detail that I'd like to kind of point out. So suppose that x is sparse in the basis psi. So x is pha, psi times theta, okay? Just to make it clear, psi is going to be a square matrix, n by n. And theta is a column vector of length n. And psi times theta gives me x. Now recall, we know something about the properties of x. We know that x is taken from an image, or taken from a video, or taken from uh, the class of piecewise constant signals or whatever it is. And based on that class of signals, we have a psi matrix where that class of signals can be sparsified. And therefore, we're going to be seeking for a sparse solution to theta. Now, x itself, the numbers in x may not be sparse. We want the thetas to be sparse. That's, that's, that's the issue here. So now we're going to also deal with noisy measurements y is equal to phi x plus n, that's the new part here is the, the noise, and x is equal to psi times theta, and therefore y is equal to phi, the measurement matrix, M-E-A-S, times psi, the sparsifying matrix, S-P-A-R, times theta, the coefficients, plus n. Now, presumably, the noise will presumably be small, small in energy, or small in something else, small in some metric that enumerates or quantifies the amount of noise. And what we're going to be looking for, we're going to be looking for a sparse vector theta, such that y is close in terms of not far away, small n, y is close to phi times psi times theta. So how can we solve this? Uh, one way to do so 
is that theta hat will be argmin of the L1 norm of theta subject to y equals phi times psi times theta. This formulation ignored the possibility of noise. It's, it's not robust, but we can also incorporate noise. So later, and this is the lasso formulation, we're going to add a term, something like lambda times y minus phi psi theta squared L2 norm. So this will be the residual, the unexplained part in the measurements, the noise. And oftentimes the noise is assumed to be Gaussian or close to Gaussian. So here we're quantifying the amount of energy in the Gaussian noise. And finally, again, this is a possible correction. So I'm gonna put a, a blue, a blue uh, circle around it and it's possible in lasso. Once we've calculated theta hat, we convert from theta hat to x hat by multiplying theta hat by the sine matrix, the sparsifying matrix. Now, of course, other recovery algorithms can be used to solve for theta, but the point that I'm trying to say here, we talked about universality. On the hardware side, we're gonna use the same hardware to sense different types of signals, the same phi matrix to sense different types of signals. And on the, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call this uh, software side, on the algorithmic side, uh, the same reconstruction algorithm can deal with different types of structures in the signal, different sparsifying bases or different sparsifying type frames. All right, so let's continue. In summary, we started with least squares, doesn't induce sparsity, ignored sparsity. We had a non-sparse solution. We went to the other extreme of L0 that totally forces sparsity. And X hat was the argmin among the solutions to Y equals phi X of the X that minimizes the L0 norm. Minimize L0 norm means minimizes the number of non-zero elements that we have. Again, not, not good. Not robust to noise, not robust to other stuff. Too slow, combinatorially slow. Our compromise solution was L1 minimization. We seek among the explanations to Y equals phi X, we seek the X that has the smallest L1 norm. L1 instead of L0 or L2. L1 minimization is computationally tractable, but it requires somewhat more measurements than L0. It's also robust to noise, and we get the correct X hat. All right, so, so let's, let's move on. We have variations on sparse recovery. And indeed, over the next several modules, we're gonna talk about uh, a technique that comes from statistical physics. So let's go from linear programs. Recall the linear, pro linear programming approach is the L1. We're seeking the X hat among all the infinitely many solutions in that subspace in the hyperplane. We're seeking the one with smallest L1 norm. But what if we have measurement noise? What if, what if we have this plus Z? And you know, Z could be assumed to be Gaussian noise or Laplace or whatever. How do we handle that? So from, from linear programs, we move to lasso. We explain, we account for the unexplained part of the measurements with a term that I described earlier, lambda times y minus phi x squared L2 norm. y minus phi x is among the x's that we're considering, phi x is uh, our hypothetical measurements and y minus phi x is the error in our actual measurements. So this is the hypothetical noise. And lambda is a Lagrangian parameter and large lambdas and small lambdas may may sort of lead to different properties in the solution. But here's the thing. If you take a well-chosen parameter lambda, lambda is a function of tau, then this equivalent is this formulation, this lasso formulation is equivalent to another formulation where x hat is the argument of 
all the x's that their L1 norm is below the threshold tau. And among all those x's with modest L1 norm, the argument of y minus phi x squared L2 norm. So we're so if you think about it, we're looking for the sparse x's with L1 norm less than or equal to tau. And among the sparse x's, because L1 is the measure of sparsity, among the sparse x's, we're taking the one that minimizes the residual. Finally, we've gone from linear programs to lasso and now to COSAMP, Compressive Sampling Matching Pursuit by Deanna Needle, the top author, and Joel Trapp, who appears below her. Uh, so here's how COSAMP works. It's an iterative method where in every iteration you perform some sort of projection. In iteration J, you find the case sparse signal estimate by pruning your current solution. So you had a solution BK, and XJ is a pruned version of that, and XJ is going to be K sparse. Next, XJ, which is K sparse, you use it to compute a residual. Again, a residual is the actual noisy measurements Y minus phi times your hypothetical solution XJ. From the residual, you compute an error. The error is phi transpose times the residual. And I'd like to note that for many types of matrices, often phi transpose phi is near diagonal. Why, why, why is that? Okay, why is that? Imagine, just imagine that, let's add a text box for this. Why is phi transpose phi near diagonal in many cases? So imagine that every element of phi is generated IID. <coughs> independent and then identically distributed. And let's further make some very mild assumptions on this IID distribution. The expected value of phi ij will be zero, so zero mean. And let's choose a variance for phi ij, not ii, but ij a variance for entry ij of the phi matrix to be some constant. Uh, let's just call it c. So now what is phi transpose phi? So first of all, on the diagonal of phi transpose phi, you can see that I'm going to be taking a column of phi and multiplying it by itself, taking an inner product with itself. And after that inner product, taking the sum of the squares. Now, why is this? <coughs> okay, so let's say this will be phi and this will be phi transpose. And overall, the result, let's call it, uh, I don't know, so other Greek letter, uh, capital pi. The result will be this square matrix. And we're looking at the diagonal and this element, diagonal entry number i is equal to column number i multiplied by column number i transposed, which becomes a row. And that column, we're taking an inner product between, col between row i, well, which is really column i, and column i. And that inner product between that column i and itself is a summation over the j's of phi in row j, column i, squared 
magnitude. Now, I'd like to highlight the, the magnitude. Uh, inner product, if, these, if this matrix is real valued, you know, squared magnitude and square the same thing. If it's complex valued, you can go look at the definitions of inner product and a conjugation is involved in that conjugation, an element mu multiplied by its conjugate is the squared magnitude. So what I'm saying is that phi transpose phi, we're assuming that the expected value of phi ij is zero mean. We're assuming that its variance is some constant. This is, this is a realistic assumption, okay? A, a lot of reconstruction algorithms, if the, if the mean is non-zero, you should be subtracting it off anyway. This is something that you know some of you may want to read up on. You can email me, you know, if you want to hear more about it. But this is a plausible assumption that the that the expected value will be close to zero, and we have some variance. Okay, now are most matrices IID? Not necessarily, but it's reasonable that if you're designing a matrix, an IID one is a reasonable starting point. So under these conditions, I'm opening another text box. Under these conditions. Entry i of the diagonal is equal to sum over j phi j i squared magnitude. Now, the expected value of phi j i squared magnitude is equal to the expected value of phi j i square plus the variance of phi j i. This is, you know, a somewhat standard result in probability courses that you can go and revisit our probability review from the beginning of the course and you can work through this. Therefore, the expected value of the squared magnitude of phi ji is zero square plus the variance of phi ij, or, well, phi ij, phi ji, same, we just transpose notation, plus c. So it's equal to c. So now uh, the summation over the i over the j's actually of phi ji square, the expected value of entry i on diagonal is equal to C. Off diagonal? Off diagonal, what happens is that we have two different columns and we're taking inner products between column I and column J. Columns I and J of phi. So sum over K of phi something like ik times phi something like jk. You can go through the details later. And phi ik and phi jk are uncorrelated. Because i is different from j. We're off diagonal. On the diagonal, i is equal to j, and we've computed that. And therefore, the expected value of the off diagonals is shown to be zero. So what I was saying is that phi transpose phi is near diagonal. Because it's near diagonal, uh, a diagonal or a near diagonal matrix multiplied by the residual uh, is going to have a, a nice form. So that's the intuition why, why this is helpful. Okay, so we calculated the residual, check mark. We calculated the error. Error is phi transpose times the residual. We then calculate the best 2K support set of the error. So omega is the support set for the 2K locations in the error vector E that are largest. And we merge support sets with what we had earlier. And we run a least square set for the support set to find the next support set, which then changing color 
goes to the next iteration. So COSAMP, again, by Needle and Trop, uh, is an iterative algorithm. And there's a theoretical analysis that shows that the error with this approach decays geometrically until you reach a noise floor. So to illustrate that graphically, imagine that the horizontal axis is the iteration number, I-T-E-R, and the vertical axis is the error. And let's say, now I'm changing color, that this will be my noise floor, meaning that by noise floor, meaning that we're, we're gonna converge to this, and this somehow depends on the magnitude of the noise, we're gonna be initially decaying quickly towards the noise floor, and then asymptotically, we'll be approaching it slowly. So that's it for this module, sparse recovery. Uh, we talked about L2. We then talked about L0. L1 is in the middle. It's a nice compromise. And from the L1 solution, we went to Lasso and then to COSAMP, which is more sophisticated. It has these nice theoretical properties. And what we're going to do next time in the next module, we're going to start talking about best possible uh, reconstruction based on ideas from statistical physics. So that'll be it for now.